Josh Barnett has had one of the most unorthodox and consequently captivating careers in the world of combat sports, becoming the youngest ever UFC heavyweight champion under the tutelage of Matt Hume, Eric Paulson, and Billy Robinson, being stripped of the belt and then going to Japan to compete in both Pancrase and Pride, where he achieved his peak form. There in the land of the rising sun, he morphed from the baby-faced assassin into the war master, going on a monstrous win streak, notably submitting the piece of shit Alexander Emilienko with a key lock and an incredibly satisfying tap out. All the while he was fighting as one of the top heavyweights in the world in Japan, the absolute mad lad began competing in professional wrestling as well, competing in both New Japan and the Inoki Genome Federation one of the most simultaneously amazing and crackhead promotions to ever exist. In both professional wrestling and mixed martial arts, Barnett wears his catch wrestling roots on his sleeve, an elite grappler with a penchant for effective yet unorthodox techniques by modern standards, such as his excellent mount game built upon the Kisagatame or scarf hold, or his usage of a toe hold to beat Hiron Gracie. Ultimately, he's one of the best shoot fighters to ever compete in professional wrestling, given that he's a literal former UFC champion, and has an incredibly unique aura as a consequence. His pro wrestling work isn't for everyone, as the shoot style grappling is intricate and grounded, but I find him to be personally incredibly compelling. As he continues to run his yearly blood sport shows, which my friend Blair did a video on that will be linked in the description, he brings his unique vision of professional wrestling very close to the intentions of the visionary himself, Antonio Inoki. With these cards continuing to attract buzz and produce excellent action, as well as the man himself providing great performances in them, it's as good a time as any to look at the War Master's excellent body of work, this time with the help from a few friends. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, it is I, Alistair Fleming. I run the Gentleman's Combatives YouTube channel. I'm an amateur fighter, professional wrestler, maker of fine quality professional wrestling and mixed martial arts gear. And I've been brought in today to uh, assist with the five match primer for Josh Barnett. Uh, today I'm gonna to be talking about the match between Kyoshi Tamara and Josh Barnett on U-Style Axis in 2005. To give some context to the match, Kyoshi Tamura is the last man standing of the UWF lineage. He debuted on one of the UWF shows in 1988, and since then has lived through the shattering of the UWF into the UWFI, PWFG, Pancrase, uh, Rings, eventually into Kingdom, uh, back to Rings, and as all of those promotions have folded changed, been absorbed into Pride, or have their had their um, quality fighters pillaged by Pride, 
Hiroshi Tamura is the only man left running a shoot style show with those original UWF rules of no close fist punches to the face, palm strikes, kick pads, and rope escapes. And it is at the time a unique product, but it's not really catching on because if you want to watch uh, Sogo Kaktogi, if you want to watch MMA, you're going to tune in and watch Pride. Now, what was holding up Pride was a bunch of Yakuza money, but at the time we didn't know that. So, U Style Axis is kind of his last big throw of the dice. He's got a lot of big names on, and he's got himself versus Josh Barnett as the main event. And Josh Barnett at this point, he's already been the UFC champion. Uh, he's already been the King of Pancrepes, beating Yuki Kondo. He's been fighting and wrestling on New Japan shows ever since he got the uh, UFC belt stripped from him. And here he is laying claim to that UWF lineage because Josh Barnett, as we know, was trained by Billy Robinson, by um, Eric Paulson, by extension, via Matt Human Paulson, uh, Carl Gotch. So, but he hasn't wrestled on a UWF lineage show until this point. And it shows a little bit in the match, but it is an excellent match, so we'll get on to that. As the match opens, Barnett is able to control Tamara. Tamara usually relies on his dynamism, his ability to jump from submission to submission and maintain a floating control on the, the top of his opponent in order to build up a lead and get ahead of them. Barnett is just shutting him down and just being on top the entire time, working scarf holds, double wrist locks, generally keeping control of Tamara until Tamara finally gets himself going with a counter knee to a single leg, hitting this uh, flying knee as Josh Barnett's holding onto that single leg and flat backing Josh into a bump, leading to the first lost point uh, in the match. At this point, this kicks Josh into gear, and he comes back uh, landing some palm strikes and hitting a very heavy suplex that gets down back. But at this point, Tamra's got himself going. The groundwork picks up in speed, the uh, transitions become more interesting and more flowy as Kyoshi Tamra is able to get control, and the takedowns from Barnett become bigger and bigger as he tries to assert himself as the big man and regain control of the match. Uh, eventually they end up in a striking exchange which puts every modern pro wrestling one to shame because the two are just throwing shoot body kicks into each other and screaming at each other. Uh, it's really great to watch. Uh, Barnett finally comes back laying claim to that UWF lineage again by catching a high kick from Tamara, locking up his hands and hitting the capture suplex which is Akira Maeda's uh, special move finisher, and Akira Maeda was the original teacher of our man Kyoshi Tamara. Now this isn't Josh Barnett's show, it is not yet Josh Barnett's blood sport. At the time, Kyoshi Tamara is the star, so of course the man's not going to win. Uh, Tamara manages to get a takedown, regain control, and sink in a very nice armbar right in the middle of the ring that Josh is incapable of escaping. But in this match, Josh lays claim to his UWF lineage, not only through his training, but through his work in the match and his ability to fight under those rules. It's really quite an exciting match, and if you can find it, as it is on the Puro Archive, uh, I really do recommend watching it. It's motherfucking sap time, bitches. Bob Sapp is something of a meme in both professional wrestling and mixed martial arts circles, seeing as he was overpushed in both sports as an unskilled but exciting and charismatic meek Goliath. If you're familiar with my Twitter, you might have already discovered that I harbor an unironic appreciation for his professional wrestling work. While he wasn't going around having five-star classics during his brief pro wrestling career, his matches are short, fun, and explosive, never overstaying their welcome. As a final note before I move on to Josh, I'd also argue that Sapp's not even the worst IWGP heavyweight champion, given that that title has been held by the likes of Evil and Tatao Yasudo. Sorry guys. This is an interesting match for Josh, because it's one of the most typical pro wrestling performances ever given by him. I'm not sure you can really describe Robert Malcolm Sapp as a shooter per se, but he has a really unique aura. So Josh is left to wrestle more like a conventional babyface wrestler than he normally does as a shoot style worker. It's a great display of range from him, proving he doesn't need to cling to just being a shooter to have a good match. 
This match begins in a pretty enjoyable exchange of power moves, with Sat mostly getting the better of Josh, screaming like a maniac by simultaneously throwing fake-looking but really fun strikes that knock him around Barnett like a pinball. Josh is a big man that normally towers over smaller Japanese wrestlers, so watching him play the babyface in peril as the smaller man is actually really interesting. This is a 6 minute match, so giving it a complete play by play doesn't really do it justice, but there are some spots here I love and want to talk about. As in most high scale babyface versus monster matches, Barnett keeps using submission holds and fast paced grappling to hang in the fight, attempting a flying armbar to slow Sap down before getting slammed in spite of it. Another great part to me is how they go to the outside. Barnett dumping Sap to the outside before hitting the ropes and following him out of the ring with a killer baseball slide dropkick. Hi Daniel Makabe. I had legitimately never seen Barnett run the ropes nor attempt any kind of tope adjacent moves, so this was an unexpected treat proving the man can do more conventional professional wrestling stuff. He just chooses not to do that most of the time. The finish is also really fun, with Barnett taking Saps back before getting the three after a German suplex. Sap getting thrown after being so physically dominant is immensely satisfying. A short, explosive match, and one you have no excuse not to watch because of the runtime and condensed insanity within. Three and three quarter stars. To describe this match as special would be the understatement of the fucking century. While not the first, Pancrase was one of the most prestigious promotions in the early days of mixed martial arts. This special organization was founded in 1993 by the wayward students of Yoshiaki Fujiwara, being Masakatsu Funaki, Ken Shamrock, and most importantly for this tale, Minoru Suzuki. Its most prominent and originally sole belt was the King of Pancras, which was an open weight title, unheard of nowadays but very common at the time. The title would become defunct shortly after Josh Barnett won it in 2003, but he is the last and therefore technically still reigning King of Pancras. Nowadays the promotion is mostly remembered by fight fans instead of pro res fans as a quirky little circus in the primordial soup of mixed martial arts, but it has a real legacy, especially in Japan. Produced in this promotion were not just some of the finest shoot fighters of their generation, but professional wrestlers of the highest order. In 2019, two of these men locked horns in an epic celebration of their shared home in maybe the most unlikely venue for UWFI-style fighting, Game Changer Wrestling. Of course, this isn't the regular Nick Gage sets a dude on fire type GCW. Instead, it's Josh's little mini promotion inside of it that does annual shows, of course being Bloodsport. The presentation is incredibly unique with the lack of ropes, and it's seen as Barnett and Suzuki make their way to the ring for the main event being hailed not as professional wrestlers, but as warriors. The match begins as a catch wrestling dick measuring contest, with a lockup and test of strength followed by a slick series of reversals by both men until the striking ensues. The striking styles of the two men feel really nice and distinct, as Barnett loves his clinch-based Muay Thai offense, and Suzuki a series of open-palmed attacks and kicks, the exact strikes that were legal in OG Pancrase. Once the grappling resumes, it's another great display of each man's stylistic quirks. Barnett using his trademark Kisa Katame countered into the legendary head scissors armbar combo of Suzuki. The mat work then really heats up, Barnett getting a back take, followed by the men trading leg lock attempts. While character work is usually more subtle in the shoot style, Suzuki makes it clear that he's a more vicious combatant as he throws strikes at Barnett while simultaneously trying to leg lock him. Josh almost gets choked out, but counters into a Fujiwara armbar, which seems to visibly piss off Suzuki, in a wonderful character moment. The general escalation of shoot style kicks in as bombs start to be thrown, with Barnett countering a headlock with a gorgeous backdrop driver. To avoid making this video 3 hours long, I'll abbreviate the following grappling exchanges now that you've gotten a taste and go to the true madness. Suzuki knocks out the referee momentarily and uses the opportunity to hit Josh Barnett with a chair on the outside. 
Eventually, once orders are turned, they absolutely kill each other up until the 20 minute time limit. But the fans are not satisfied. They decide to add five more minutes to the match, with the two men going all out to try and secure the win. These five minutes are undoubtedly the best part of the match, as the condensed violence does a little recap of the first 20 with some great callbacks. Ultimately, the five minutes end in another draw, but neither man has anything left to prove. They hug and bow, showing mutual respect. Two sons of Ketch and Pancrase have tested their might, and proven to be equals. Violent art of the highest order, and it might be perfect if there is just a little color. Four and three quarter stars. One of the most impressive products of the New Japan developmental system in recent years, Shibata Jr. I, I mean Red Narita, is a superb young wrestler with a bright future ahead of him. A throwback to men like his trainer, who occupied a much grittier niche of pro res than more modern workers like an Okada, the so-called Son of Strong style more than earns the moniker, with a highly developed mat work and overall grappling game for someone so young. The common pitfall of the so-called Noki cosplayer subclass of wrestlers that Andos and I both coined is wrestling with affectations of grit without truly having it. So Josh Barnett is a great test to see what kind of stuff Narita is truly made of. Barnett enters in some of the most dorky gear I've ever seen, but I love him for it. Rocking a tank top, wrestling pants, and Adidas wrestling boots you would wear for an actual amateur wrestling match. It looks pretty weird in a modern pro wrestling environment, but it also distinguishes Barnett as someone alien to the modern New Japan style in a good way, adding to his shooter aura. The match begins with some fun mat work, Josh dragging Narita to the ground with a back take, and countering a reversal with a double wrist lock and flipping him into an immediate leg lock attempt. The two reverse leg lock attempts with rolls back and forth, until eventually upon standing back up, Narita gets leverage and backs Josh into the ropes, winning something of a moral victory as he stares down the War Master, until the referee finally pushes him aside. Barnett, however, reverses the tide, using an amateur wrestling arm drag to bring Narita into a scarf hold. Narita repeatedly escapes before being brought back down to the mat the frustrated Barnett getting more and more grumpy with the resilience of the young lion. Finally, the cycle is broken after a Kimura attempt, when Narita hits a crazy belly-to-belly -belly driver thingy I don't completely understand, but is absolutely fucking sick. Barnett does a great sell job by immediately popping back up before staggering as the full pain of the driver sets in, something you see actually a lot with shoot MMA knockouts. Narita uses his momentum to get a great double underhook suplex, which gets two. Narita then royally fucks up, letting Josh catch his kick and hit him with one of the best Superman suplexes in the business, which gets two. Narita makes his last stand with an armbar attempt that's countered by a disgusting overhead driver thing that gives shades of Jessica and Draj sending Thug Rose to the Shadow Realm. They trade penalty kicks and a lovely nod to Shibata until the brilliant finishing sequence, a backdrop driver transitioned into MMA grounded pound, and finally an armbar that secures Barnett the win. Overall, it's a really charming match that gives the young lion a lot of shine as he holds his own against the shoot fighting badass. Barnett sells wonderfully for young Narita, with the pretty simple story of the Son of Strong Style's determination to beat Barnett on the mat losing himself the match after getting caught with some vicious slams. A great celebration of old school New Japan. Four stars. Masakatsu Funaki and Josh Barnett, when you really break both men down, are not so different professionally. Both Barnett and Funaki were extremely accomplished at a young age, both have remarkable MMA records, both found crossover success in pro wrestling, and both still deliver exceptionally even if they're considered out of their quote-unquote athletic prime. Which is precisely why Funaki found a lot of interest in Barnett when he called him out at Noah's Majestic show at Ryogoku Sumo Hall. Funaki has a lot of respect for Barnett, but in this match, despite all that respect, 
Barnett promises to bury Funaki under the ring and in front of his loved ones in Osaka at the N1 Finals, where their date with Destiny is to be contested under GHC martial arts rules. The rules in question, no rounds. Each opponent is allowed three knockdowns and up to three yellow cards for moments of precipity. None of that really matters in this match, but it does reflect how legitimate Barnett and Funaki want this match to be to really prove who the better fighter is, without any sense of shenanigans or outliers. Just two men, students in Masters of Catch Wrestling, laying it all out in the ring. Before the match, I gotta shout out Barnett being a massive nerd by having his entrance theme be the first fist of the North Star opening. That rules, but real ones know, tough boy, the second opening is better. Barnett's strategy is simple here. Use his size and strength advantage to keep Funaki grounded as to nullify his striking advantage, using his grappling and catch wrestling experience to go for holds like a double wrist lock, knee bar, and one hell of a struggle to hit a rough looking DDT that spikes Funaki. Funaki, on the other hand, relies on his strikes to soften and daze Barnett into his submissions, like hitting savage kicks to Barnett's calves, which if you've ever watched enough shoot style or even MMA in general, you know hurts like hell. And one god dammer of a Sakuraba knee that opens up Barnett for a deep guillotine. What I appreciate most about Barnett in this match is his sense of pace. You can tell by his movements that he is constantly thinking and moving his way out of Funaki's holds, as well as how to get Funaki into one of his own. Demonstrated once Funaki takes Barnett's back for a mount, he meticulously works on Funaki's feet to escape the hold, and get onto his side to prevent Funaki from attacking, and attempts a knee bar on Funaki that immediately forces Funaki to the ropes. It's this sense of aggression and momentum with Barnett's offense, which reveals Funaki's strengths in this match as he's impressive with his defense, as every time Barnett goes for a submission, Funaki creates space that prevents Barnett from really sinking in a submission. Subtle moments where Funaki tries to prevent Barnett from getting a full mount by trapping his leg with his own, clasping his arms to push Barnett back from doing damage by being in full mount, and more impressive, like Funaki using his legs to reverse a Kesa Gatame into a leg choke that forces Barnett to the ropes. I particularly love the moment where Funaki takes advantage of Barnett looking for a hold on his lower body from behind and just cranks on Barnett's ankle to make him pay for offering such an easy target. But like I said, Funaki is more adept at throwing hands and feet as he starts lighting up Barnett. But Barnett is also willing to give just as much as he takes as he offers Funaki receipt with a powerful palm strike that flattens Funaki. But giving Funaki space and knowing full well Barnett will shoot for a limb, drops Barnett with the aforementioned Sakuraba knee, that transitions into a really suspenseful moment where Funaki sinks in a guillotine so deep that you honestly believe that Funaki can definitively put Barnett away. However, being the bigger and stronger of the two, Barnett uses every bit of that advantage to escape the hold and absolutely deadlifts Funaki for a desperate and crazy looking driver as he dumps Funaki right on his head, giving Barnett the knockout victory in 10 minutes and 21 seconds. Both men work so well to establish a sense of struggle and desperation, with a pace both men put on makes for really exciting moments where the struggle for working towards a limb or a strike feels earned. Whether that's Barnett constantly moving his way in and out of holds and submissions, or Funaki meticulously waiting for his moment to take an advantage that puts over his experience. It's one of the great matches to get someone into shoot style as it emphasizes little stories and meticulous details that rewards the viewer with agonizing submissions and wizard brain violence as they lay everything in the ring to make you believe in them and the struggle they commit to. Long live the King of Pancrase, Masakatsu Funaki, and the War Master, Josh Barnett. In the summary, Josh is a living time capsule to the old days of pro res. A man with a very specific vision of what this art form is, very similar to Inoki. And our sport is all the better for having somebody like that still around. It's absolutely crazy to me that because of his blood sport shows, we've had men like Minoru Suzuki, Hideki Suzuki, and Ikuhisa Minoa doing UWFI style shoot wrestling in front of small indie crowds in the States. Given that there's a significant likelihood the War Master himself sees this, I'd like to thank Mr. Barnett for his dedication to not only preserving shoot wrestling, but the noble art of catch wrestling as well. He may not wrestle a lot, but whenever he gets announced for a show, I'm excited, and I hope you can now learn to do the same. Until next time, remember that in fact, pro wrestling is quite strong.